check on our individual congressmen to tell them to change their position is not really going to be very constructive. So my question to you is, what kind of creative approaches would you suggest that different groups and individuals might use to, um, to, to approach our congressmen to create a win-win situation where they might uh, consider changing their, uh, their overt support for Israel? Well, given that 100 senators just voted to yes. destroy Gaza, you know, it, it's very hard. And Bar I'm in Barbara Lee's district, um, and, you know, even Barbara Lee, she won't speak out on this. So, James Law, I first learned this from James Lawson, um, the architect of, of uh, a lot of the civil rights movement, um, that without grassroots pressure, the top doesn't change. So, we really have to create a social movement that pushes in every direction, social, political, economic. You know, we have to come at it from a lot of different ways, academic, law. You know, medical, prof uh, medical professionals who have seen what is going on in Gaza could organize here, you know, and, and give a, a presentation in the hospitals. Lawyer, I mean, every place that we have access, because we have to create a very large social movement because the United States would not be in partnership with Israel if it, if it didn't benefit all these corporations that are yeah. making so much money from this. And then we have to kind of learn the talking points, um, which are available through SJP and JVP and other places. When we get the pushback, we have to, you know, it's a Kingian approach. You do the research. You uh, do the power mapping, you do the social movement building, the education, so that you build toward policy and institutional change. And then, then they will follow, but not until we're ready to go. And n just never give up. Never, ever, ever, ever give up. Because at some point, all this pushing and all this movement, bringing petition, you know, calling your the council, the city council, all of it, again and again, from every direction, it will make a difference. And I can tell you, I was in Detroit before I came here, advocating for uh, Presbyterian divestment for a week. My second Presbyterian. <laughs> I think I've been to General Assemblies more than the Presbyterian. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know, there was a team of 15 of us from JVP, mostly young people. They threw in a couple rabbis, you know, for good measure. And um, we talked, I don't know, we talked to so many people, but they finally passed it. We won by seven votes where we lost by two last night. So that will mean that we have to support the Presbyterian Church here in Albuquerque because they're going to get, you know, now that Gaza, if, it, if the ceasefire lasts, all of that that's been hidden uh, in terms of attack, it will come back. So um, we just have to keep organizing in every way that we can until we achieve policy and institutional change. And I, I'd, like, I'd like to add one thing to that, to that answer in, in response to the question. Because the question started out with, a, with the presumption that APEC and the organized Jewish community had a chokehold on Congress. The fact is, it is the intelligence establishment, the defense establishment, what used to be called the military-industrial complex that has the chokehold. And as long as they have the chokehold, nothing's going to change until we relieve that chokehold. And those people, the, the, that establishment is quite content to let APAC and the organized Jewish community be the front people for them and take the blame for what is happening but without that establishment, without the security state, APAC and the organized Jewish community would have no influence whatsoever. It is not the Jewish establishment that's doing it. The Jewish establishment is serving a secret. Yes. The agenda of, of the people who are of people who are hiding and who are the ones who really have the power. Okay. And, Those are the people we have to and take nonetheless, the power. it's still everybody has a choice. So APAC is making the choice, and ADL is making the choice. 
And so they are choosing to cooperate if you, if you want to put it in that context. And so we have to interrupt that every way we can, especially those of us who have access. And everybody can actually have access. Yes? Speaking of organizing, um, there are some phone numbers here on the dry erase board of our local members of Congress uh, with their local telephone number and their DC office telephone number, and you can leave a message if it's after hours. But I'd love to see a, sh a show of hands of people who, ha who have contacted their member of Congress about the bombing of Gaza. Just raise your hand just to get a poll about half of us. So the other half, I challenge you to get those numbers and, and make those phone calls. Thank you. And, do, and have your friends do it too. You can have a party and phone calls. Yes, yes. I'd like to, um, if we can't, if we can't just, just keep these short because yeah. we have somebody Skyping in from yes. Israel in 10 minutes yes. and we haven't drawn an APD connection yet. Oh, okay. oh just two more questions or how many more? Will I, <clears throat> I just wanted to reinforce nonviolent resistance. And there's a quote, you won't find it online. It was done at uh, Daniel Berrigan at Kirkridge in Bangor, Pennsylvania. And it goes like this. He said, nonviolence is, is not only the way we win, it's the only way we can win. And he said, and besides, they have all the tanks. I don't even have one. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Julie with SJP, and we initiated a divestment campaign this spring. Woo! Yeah! And um, so we did have a couple of members from JVP come and support us, which was really great. It was really helpful. We were a little bit successful, and then it was unsuccessful, but you know how divestment is. But my question is, <laughs> um, if, if you have any other ideas of ways that community groups like JVP can, be, can support us on our camp on-campus initiatives. That's kind of a tricky one. Um, I think the first thing is to have a longer, like I said, I think it's really important. Um, it's what Nora and I did when we created a network in, in uh, the Bay Area. We brought together everybody working on the issue. Sabil, JVP, I mean there were lots of groups. We, we, and then we had a council, we had a kind of day-long retreat. And we started to look at what each of us was doing. And we, we cast our net pretty far, academics, lawyers, healthcare professionals, uh, activists in, you know, in the more traditional sense. And we were able to create our campaign out of that. So um, I, that's what I would suggest. But if you go online, JVP has always got stuff going on. Um, our latest was free, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but you know, we all helped signs. Um, Freedom for Palestine, with you know, so there's lots of creative creative ideas out there, but bring your community together, call a summit, make a summit of er anybody who's interested in working on uh, justice for Palestine, cast the net wide, you guys can facilitate it, and then uh, you know we'll come come together and figure out if there is a need for. A, a campaign that really everybody can participate in. There's a question. One Thank one. you. And I'll be here a little after. I'm now going to um, break my fast. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to say one thing, Alan. Um, Lynn mentioned uh, dehumanization, and that's, of course, a tactic on the part of. Uh, People who want to militarize our, our countries, um, and when you enter, you see dehumanization in with regards to Hamas, because every time we mention the slaughter in Gaza, the the wall that comes up is Hamas, and I have a flyer here that has a little statement on it that kind of puts Hamas into context, and we need to remember when people say that Hamas is the enemy of that guy that Israel has an army, an air force, and um, numerous uh, high-tech weaponry, and, ha and all the Palestinians have to defend themselves is Hamas. So uh, I just want to pass this around. Read it, read it. Okay. Um, I'd read like to ask how many people here um, found out about this from an, an email from National JVP? She wants to read Anybody? it, Alan. Okay, go ahead. All right, I'll read this. You, take my water, burn my olive trees, destroy my house, take my job, steal my land, imprison my father, kill my mother, bomb my country,
starve us all, humili humiliate us all, but I am to blame because I fired a rocket back. Uh, how many people, yeah. how many people here signed in when you came in? Okay, of those who signed in when you came in, how many of you will come to city council when we ask for a proclamation? How many of you who haven't signed in will come to city council and talk when we ask for a proclamation? And how many of you will sign in so we can reach you? <laughs> There's sign -in, sheet back on the sign in sheet back on the table, we'll pass it around again. And how many people here who donated when you came think you didn't donate enough? <laughs> Um, and we'll, if we can, we'll share some with the uh, Peace and Justice Center and Friends of Seville. Um, just quickly, um, I won't read it, but, but Rabbi Lynn said that, that ADL and other Jewish organizations are proud of the terrorism training. This is off a website where the ADL is bragging about taking American police to Israel for training. Um, there are a number of testimonials on the JINSA website. JINSA is Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs. Um, their program where they train police is called LEAP, L-E-E-P, Law Enforcement Ex Exchange Program. I will just, because I want to get to our um, guest Skyping from Israel, I will just read two quotes from a participant. And, and among the participants are people from terrorist riddled municipalities like North Las Vegas, Nevada, and Hennepin County, Minnesota. These quotes, these quotes are from the, from the chief of police, retired chief of police of Garden Grove, California. American law enforcement and American public safety is starving for this kind of information the experience the Israelis can bring. That's the first quote. The second quote is, LEAP is providing an extremely valuable tool for American law enforcement executives to learn from our Israeli counterparts. I pray we never experience in America what Israel faces daily. But if we do, those that have been on these trips will be better prepared. Now, I picked this individual to quote from because Jensa says that, that in 2005, the then chief of New Mexico State Police, Carlos Maldonado, went on a trip to Israel. And in 2009, Albuquerque police officers took this training. We don't know which Albuquerque police officers or what the connection was that got them there. But the chief of police of Garden City, California, is named Joe Polisar. Anybody been here long enough to remember Joe Polisar? He, 20 years ago, when the first wave, when, well, no, when a wave of killing which led to one of the first police reform movements in Albuquerque took place, Joe Polisar was the chief of police in Albuquerque. So where is this coming from? And it's coming around in a circle. Okay, now let me see if I can get um, Yotam Feldman, who produced the lab. And Sam, what do you have? The petition still or the sign in? Hmm? Is there, if there's anyone who, Stan is holding up the petition, um, it's, again, it's for, to call on the Albuquerque City Council, to call on the federal government to withhold the money that Albuquerque pays in federal taxes that's going to fund the Israeli military and the occupation to keep it in Israel. And with that, let me see if I can get your time to direct it. The lab about the Israeli arms industry for export, exporting technology and weapons for use around the world. Oh, I think I've seen you. Nice to see you again. 
Hey, can I talk to you after you can you <laughs> COVID or we will, yeah. How are you doing? My networks. A couple of the correspondents have a So, how Well, you know her, uh, I remember her boyfriend, John. Yeah. Uh, his family's from Connecticut. So, they went out on a trip uh, over Christmas, right? Over Christmas. And she went out and toured the school. She liked it. She applied. And she got accepted. Yeah. 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 I think they did cover her. I think she might have taken the yeah. You know, I, I doubt if I ever anybody from San Diego go to the list. Yeah. 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 In, in all the years I was in San Diego, I remember one guy who went to Cornell. And he was the only person I've ever gotten to be able to take classes at Brown. Is she in more trouble tomorrow? Just graphic art. She did a lot of uh, New Mexico inspired art in her portfolio. She did an article. See the headline. He just got out. It's 5 30 in the morning. Can you hear us? Not if you can hear us, shake your head no. Well, can you hear us? No, he can't hear us. Talk louder, Alan. I'm right here. If he can, if he can, it's, it's not, can you hear us? Your time, can you hear us? Try unplugging. No audio. This thing right here? Can you hear us? Oh, well, can you hear us? Hello. Point your ears. Hello. I don't think, I don't know if you can hear us. Well, uh... <laughs>